Well, the 60s were very uh, uh, exciting for me. I still was having children. Um, in the 60s, I had five more children, I believe. But my older children, who were born in the 50s, were uh, in middle school and uh, and then in the later 60s, they were in high school. And so um, I had been a, well, I had been a home mom, but then I started working at the schools in the late 60s because of my younger children, uh, I would go in and help. I always wanted to be a teacher, and I thought, well, that dream is, gonna, I don't know if it'll happen or it'll be on hold because I had all these children to raise. But in the 60s, I started taking night classes at East LA College where I just took a few core classes, English, and uh, those English classes were wonderful because the the class there were night classes and the people who came to those were um, voice voiceful talked about issues and our writing assignments just brought out things that I, I had only been you know besides my raising my children and in, in involvement with their school that I would read in the paper or sometimes on television. I didn't even watch a lot of television then. And so it, was, it just brought up some issues, especially, well, at, the, at that time, uh, the communism, the labeling of communists, of activists. And so it really was interesting to me, and I, it just opened up a whole new world for me as far as uh, uh, social issues and, and world issues, too. So that was, you know, that went on in the uh, middle 60s, I took some classes. But I also then decided that I, that I would take some art classes. And so I just kind of gradually crept back into school. I had been away from school since, for 15 years. And by that time, by the early 60s, by the late 60s, I had nine children. <laughs> so I, had, I was pretty busy. But one of the things that I did do when I uh, had my last child uh, I started taking, uh, getting involved in this kindergarten and early grades of my uh, fact Rosanna when she was a, went into preschool, and then I got hired uh, as an education aide. One was a started in a private um, uh, what do they call those um, the, the pre K oh preschool yeah I can't think of the name they call them. Uh, Head Start. Head Start. A Head Start program. But then when I enrolled them, her in public school for first grade, then I had the other ones still that were coming up for preschool. And so I really became involved in volunteering uh, in, the, in their classrooms. And then I, I got hired as an education aide. So I started working as an, in the school in 1967, but I had been working you know, pre, about four or five years before that in the Head Start program. And so that just was something that I loved, and I had a lot of fun. And so I saw my children, they were, uh, you know, go through there, and then they went on to first grade, and then I, but I mostly work with the, the very young children. And getting to, since it was in my own neighborhood, I, all these people that came through there were people I knew and just connected with them, and it just gave me that you know, my burning desire to go back to school. And luckily, when I was working in the, I, I, they moved me up to a, a, a higher grade as an, as an education aide. And then a program came in that was called College Opportunity. And it was designed for education aides who wanted to go into teaching. And so they, it was a great federal program. At the schools, of course, in East LA, uh, they were funded by federal funds for the when the bilingual program started. In, in the early 60s, many, many immigrants were coming in, and so many of the children had, had, didn't speak English. And it was kind of dire because most of them were just set at the at, at, you know at the back of the room, and so the TAs would they weren't called TAs then. The education aides would help them mostly translating, and so the teacher almost gave the full responsibility uh, uh, off the record, kind of, mm -hmm. to the education aid. So then what they started doing was they started giving us uh, 
le uh, classes through the University of Austin who would come because they had a bilingual program there. And then they were patterned after Dade County in uh, Florida. Florida because of all the Cuban uh, Spanish-speaking children. So it all just kind of swelled and pretty soon but L.A. district was just becoming uh, so filled with uh, Spanish, non-English speaking children. And so it was, a, a, for me, it was an opportunity to just get immersed in, in teaching. And so I took, uh, I went into that college opportunity program, and it was housed, it was, it was taught at East LA College. And then when I finished with, a, with a, the two year, I got my um, associate, associate, <laughs> AA. AA. <laughs> yeah. And then when I would transfer to UC to Cal State LA, I applied for a small scholarship with the Ford Foundation, which was apart from the, and I got that. And of course, I was a very good student, I have to say, because I, that was my passion. And uh, so when I went on to Cal State, that was in 1972, I was still a, a working at the school, but I was working towards a credential by then. And it was just a wonderful experience because I have I made lifelong friends. And it also brought up the fact that so many of our, of the children that went through the school system in the 30s, 40s, were really not prepared for high school even. Uh, many of the women, and there was a few men, uh, who were in that program had been out of school for 15, 20 years. And so the, the writing skills were really, you know, in, uh, uh, needed writing skills and English skills. They had gone through the system. Some had not finished, but the majority of them had. But they were not, it was not, uh, it was hard for, for most of the participants to to do the writing, to, you know, to a, a, a college level, you know, um, work. And so then they designed some classes for like remedial work. And, uh, but they, we didn't have it, we were all in the same program, so that's what they did. But I, I, I it was, I felt I really benefited. I, not that I was uh, better, but I always did well in school, especially in English. And uh, since I was very young, I was bilingual, you know, by the time I went into kindergarten, although it was all Spanish speaking in my neighborhood, that was my first language. But I really benefited from that program. It, it honed my skills, learned many new ones. And then I did a liberal studies. Um, so it was such a well-rounded education, I felt. Got lots of art as electives and science. And uh, throughout my career, I've really mix the two because the same precepts for for you know the formulas about science uh, discovery and uh, um, solving problems you know applied to, I felt in art and then the other thing in the 60s while I was in uh, working at the elementary school the, the school was Hamill Street School which is no longer there uh, it was the school I went to as a child too and my brother who was you know, in his, his, his 80s now. Uh, the teacher I had, who I chose to be my master teacher, May Cowan, was the best teacher of any teacher I've ever had, college, university. It was, she was the best, and she, I learned so much from her, and I really patterned my, my teaching, or uh, her philosophy, rather, after hers because she, she had an open structure, but she called it experiential uh, learning, where the, she had stations uh, in the classroom. So I ran a couple, but then of course I, I had the Spanish speaking children. It was a mixed, mixed uh, uh, language program. The children were immersed in both languages, or exposed to both <coughs> languages and emerged in their uh, native language, but they still had, you know, a little bit of each. And I see some of the the programs now that are so popular, the immersion program, it's been happening since the, <laughs> the 50s and 60s, successfully. I felt it was a, such a wonderful experience because I got, before I be, took my education classes, I had been taking training and teaching, especially in language, in Spanish, but you know, when you're like you said, if when you're bilingual, uh, the 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 learning of language or linguistics is they help each other, mm -hmm. 
and being that I had been uh, Spanish speaking first, and it was my mother's Spanish. I didn't study it, uh, so I learned a lot of Spanish or what they would say proper Spanish because I would use it Spanglish sometimes. But as far as uh, uh, I guess conjugation and and uh, sentencing, uh, things that you learn by by speaking only were already ingrained in me, and then learning about the structure of la of the language. And it's the same way to learn about the structure of English. You know, of course, the, the vowels are different. But all that together, just, I, I thought, I, mean, I feel so fortunate that I was able to have that kind of uh, education to teach uh, children reading or language. And I, um, I love language. Uh, I, I, I became very interested in, in linguistics because I started to see how, if I understood it in English, even though I, Many times I didn't pronounce it correctly, but I I could, you know, I could understand. I knew the meaning, and so in a sentence or in reading, that was something I had never dealt with, especially technical uh, topics. But I could recognize meanings just because I was bilingual, and I had. Then I, stu you know, when I studied Spanish, but I got my my wings clipped in the university when I had Sp I took span up to Spanish three. And uh, I, I remember one time I, I felt, well, I know more Spanish. And usually, you know, I was already in my 40s. So when you're in, in, a, in college or in the university, most of the students are younger. And, you know, I'm not, I wasn't there to, to, uh, to look for a boyfriend or to pass my time. You know, I, had, I wanted to finish and learn as much as I could. So sometimes, you know, the old, uh, older students really did well, or at least they were so much more focused. Well, yeah, so was, students are better. <laughs> and so you run for your money if you're yeah, a teacher. Yes, and so you know, we just just were involved in learning and getting your your information and, and doing your best. Of course, not that young people didn't, but they had a, other things going on, and, and the you know the clubs and all this. So I you know I didn't have time for that because once I was in school, I would go home. My mother, if I couldn't have done this without my mother and my husband and my oldest sons, because they helped with babysitting. And when my husband wasn't there, my mother, my, my kids went to her house. When I was in the pre, when I was uh, eight, I was near home. I would go home at noon and see if, see if I could help her with something, get something from my fridge, or take it down to her house to prepare something. But it was. I mean, it was nonstop, so the only time I ever had to myself to study was after they were all asleep. So I would stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning, sometimes later. And then if I, when I finished my work, my homework, I would just draw. And I, I did so much artwork during those, the late 60s and early 70s than I've ever done. And I want to discipline myself to do that again because I have so much work. Whether it was maybe just drawing and sketching with the materials I had at my disposal, I could not afford. I took a oil painting class at East LA College during the early 60s, and I enjoyed it. I didn't become, you know, it was just one one year class, but I couldn't afford those materials, so I I did that there, and and then I went back to watercolors, and usually it was the school grade watercolors, and. But all this time, of course, you know, it was went hand in hand with with my going to school, my kids, and then uh, my son, my oldest son, in 19, uh, he graduated from from middle school in 1968. So all those years, I was I was in, not as involved in the middle school because I was so involved in the elementary school. But those were year, years that. I started to become aware, social awareness, and uh, having a voice. Like it, it, I always say that it gave me a voice because, in the even in the school where I worked at during the the tumultuous begin before the, the the walkouts and before the moratorium, things were just brewing, and and you started to see that. First of all, with the participants of my age who were part of the COP program. And then with some of the students that were coming through, especially Spanish-speaking students, who were not really getting their the best that they, that could be. One of the things my my master teacher, her name is May Cowan, 
she said, you know, when you are a teacher, you have to look at these children like they're your own children. How, what do you want for your own son and daughter? You can't give them less. That would Then you shouldn't be a teacher because you have to want the same for them that you want for your children. And it's true. And if you don't feel that way, how can you live with yourself if you say, oh, God. And it was done quite a bit, you know. Uh, there were, I, I could count the teachers in my on my hand that I had that meant something to me. And they were throughout the, the grades, but they were teachers who made a difference. And so I always felt, I want to make a difference, <laughs> and whether it's small. And then the ones that I worked with, uh, I picked I picked teachers that I felt were really good teachers, that I liked the way they, they treated the children and their philosophy of fairness, and yet strictness. I could not deal with with palsy kinds of teaching because it just it just doesn't work. Because if you're a parent, well here I had nine kids and now I've had thousands of students in my twenty eight career. I don't not counting my education aid. It you have to be the leader. You can't be a pal or a, you could be friendly and you could be compassionate but but you still have to show that what you say is what has to be followed. And I don't mean dictatorial because you still you have to consider the feelings and, and I learned along the way I wasn't perfect, but uh, it it just is a, a something. Teaching is a career that you never have it all. You don't know it all. You 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 learn a lot and you learn as you go and you apply it and uh, and it's so exciting. The first uh, head start that I got involved in where my daughter Rosanna went to was, it was a, um, I guess it's a Presbyterian church in East LA and I think it was the, the name of that center was called Cleland House and the teacher was one of my friends who I graduated with from middle school and high school uh, involved with that church. I'm not sure what denomination is but they were, um, well you know they had, they got much money, and it was very grassroots, uh, very comfortable, and um, the teacher that that, that taught uh, the class was wonderful. She loved it because it was her community, children that she, from family she knew, so it, was, it wasn't it was someone from the outside, and that was, I think, the, the why I just loved it, because I knew where her heart was, she, and she, I, I, help, I came in as an aide, but I did some work for her, like uh, art and cultural things. But the funding was, was very, um, I guess it was limited because the, the, it had been on for a, a couple of years or three years before you know, I was involved in it. And uh, they had uh, good, good materials, but it, in retrospect, it was really small. I thought it was wonderful if they had everything they needed, but it was, they were all, always, you know, counting, being a little frugal with things they bought, but initially they, I think, either the church or the government money, they had equipment that was, for me, I thought it was wonderful, but compared to what, you know, eventually the schools had, it was, you know, really small, small change. But it was so necessary It was for so necessary. All the children who were there, were from the immediate neighborhood, and most of them, you know, were, I would say somewhere at the poverty level. I didn't, I didn't consider myself at the poverty level, but I, we had very small means. My husband was a truck driver, and I lived my mother, I, my mother's house that she rented to us for fifty dollars a month. Can you believe that in the sixties? But uh, so it was. I mean, I, I never said. Oh, such need. Well, I always say when, when we were little, I didn't know we were poor, but also my, I owe it to my mother who was such a resourceful person, and she, we got our needs, and mostly it was food, and things to do, and uh, clothes that she embellished from, uh, you know, from the government, because we were given a, a dole of food and uh, we would get a tonic, like a 
it was, it was, uh, I loved it. it. Was I think it was like molasses, and there was like a health thing for a, for poor people. We'd go and get our dole of, uh, and then at school we would get cod liver oil, and uh, because it was for poor, very poor kids, we'd get in a line and they'd give us a cod liver oil, and then a, an orange. The and orange it, is like a reward, right? No, it wasn't a reward. It was put put on by the by the county's uh, oh, health. I I was trying to think it was a reward for the oh, liver. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Like getting them taste no, out of your mouth. Some people didn't like it, you know, but I, I, I thought it was okay. <laughs> but the, in the Head Start, they, they also had a small nutrition. They would get a, a lunch, and it was just a snack, but it was, um, I can't remember what the snacks were. And then a nap time. So it was like kindergarten, and I, I, I loved working in it. And I was really uh, very so grateful that I had that kind of a program. You know, having had all those children, my early, my oldest children, who were born in the early 50s to mid-50s, there were four of them, they went to kindergarten, but you know, there was never that kind of program. All the children who went through there, I could see uh, their parents really appreciated, and there was a lot of parent involvement, and, and, um, uh, People wanted to bring. I mean, the people just wanted more, more of it, um, because they, their children were happy and and it helped them, especially with language. It was all about language, learning language through experiences, through activities, through you know, of course, lessons. But it was, uh, you know, it's no different than than Sesame Street, mm -hmm. because it's it, it targets the very young child. Now, it started getting more into academics by when I was teaching. In my teaching career, um, they were teaching, you know, the, the sounds and the letters. And I, I think that was okay for some children, but it's not for everybody. I think it should be fun, and children should be uh, able to socialize and also to learn language because that was, that's the, that, I saw that throughout my career as the, most needed thing, uh, and then with with children from not just Mexico, from other countries who have to learn, they would say uh, they have to learn how to describe their environment, and if they don't have that language, it affects their writing skills. They could do it in their own language, but if they have to perform in a in English for testing and everything, or moving on to another district where there's no Spanish uh, support. Uh, they're going to struggle because they have to learn as they go, and uh, and to have someone direct them to this is how you know you many children can learn on their own. I, I many children and young children do that all the time, but you also need support and to enhance that and to expand it and to heighten it. And the more language that people learn, children learn, uh, it just affects the, the whole the rest of your learning throughout your life. It, it works for, I mean, it's true of adults, but especially for young children before five years old, it's it's the most, well, it's been learned, uh, proven that that is the most learning, uh, the span of most learning in your entire life is your first five years. So language yeah. is so important. Well, my husband was a truck driver, and he had worked very hard most of his, all his life. He was the oldest of 14. His family used to go to the, as we called it, the uh, fruit picking every summer. His, his dad had a job here. He had to work all the time, his dad. And uh, so summers was the opportunity for all the family to make some money. And so since he was the oldest, he was the man because his dad would take the whole family, I mean, all 14 of them at one time, at least 10, if not, you know, not all of them, uh, even the babies, because that. And so then he would drop them off, come back, and go to work, because that was, they had, and they lived in a really poor, poor house. I mean, I, uh, when I, he was, they were poor, and, uh, so his, my, my husband and his family would go, to, and they would get together with other family members. Um, they had a compound where they went to year after year and worked the whole summer. And of course, my, my husband 
as a teenager, carried the bulk of the work with his brothers, but mostly him. And then with that money that they they earned, that's how they would buy shoes and clothes for school. So it was a, like a one-time thing. So, you know, I don't know how many pairs they could get. Uh, now, my husband went up to middle school. He, he graduated from middle school and then the day after joined in the Army. He felt that that was the best way he could help his mom. Uh, because all he, he was uh, he was actually 16, 17, but his mother signed that he was eligible because uh, he couldn't have gone it without it. And so they were all beginning to go into high school, and it, it's sad because he said he he didn't wear shoes when he was in up to sixth grade. He didn't have enough shoes, and so he said my his soles were thick, so he could step on glass. And so he had shoes only for special occasions, but for so he missed a lot of school because he was embarrassed. But but in, at uh, middle school, he got a perfect award attendance. He never missed. He loved school. He just not. And then uh, he excelled in sports. So he was like the, the person you know everybody admired. Yeah, I remember <laughs> you talked about asking him to say the Hawkins. <laughs> and so you know he he uh, he was very much. In, uh, was uh, very much uh, supported that my children were in school. And of course, I was very, very um, educationally minded. And so he, he loved that. And so I had, he knew that I had always wanted to be a teacher. And, uh, but I just had this, I just had to go to school. <laughs> it, was, it was something that I had put off. And then by the time I had my ninth daughter, I, I would just say, I, I just have to. So I, I actually started with um, like elective kind of class. But then when I really, I said, I'm going to take English class. I took two classes at night. And he says, well, if you could manage, but you know, if without, my mother would help me. And when I started f full time, well, it helped our, our you know, with our, uh, I, I was, you had to be a full time, um, you had to have full time uh, hours working to be in that COP program. You had to carry 12 units, but you had to be a, full, a six hour aid. You couldn't be like part time. Because uh, I guess they felt that, that was a commitment to become a teacher. That was the goal eventually. And uh, so that was kind of tough, very tough, because I had, I wasn't home, you know. And so we didn't really make an arrangement. It just fell into place. Because what I was trying to do was to be there, you know, come home at noon and, and uh, my cl my classes were from four o'clock on. I would, well, since I worked near near the school is near the house, I would come home and and do. But my mother would take care. I didn't really have to do things for her, but I just wanted to make sure things were going. And and so, the only thing that that I think the downside of that period was that my husband I didn't see him as much and. Your mom must have been very proud of you. She was, and she was very strong on, on education. She had gone to a third grade in Mexico, and she owed that possibility to her great grandmother who raised her because she said she had to go to school in, in those days, in the you know turn of the century into the early third grade was uh, uh, considered uh, the, the limit for rural places, you know, third, but, you know, when I compared third grade to our third grade children, they were so far advanced. It was like sixth grade. So they packed a lot of learning in those uh, third grade classes. Uh, it changed. I don't know when it did, but I think they were required to go. The requirement was to sixth grade. And then to go on further, it, it took people who could afford to send their kids to the next grades, the higher grades. But in the rural places, I think it was up to six to eight. But you know, of course, when my mother was in school, she was grateful that her grandma said, "You have to go to school," because they would have dropped out or not had any schooling at all. Now I was already, I was already teaching. I started teaching in 1975, and uh, I would take a bus. Not, I, I would take a bus there at uh, Gage and. When I had, when I took a bus, I took the bus there on Gage and uh, Cesar Chavez. That would leave me over there at Cal State. 
and um, I remember a couple of times that I walked by the the, the um, mosaics weren't there yet still and uh, I kind of I didn't know what was in there because the, uh, the corner had been a bookstore and I went there all the time it was a a religious bookstore so I always went in there looking for beyond religious books, the art or cultural books. There were once in a while I would find, so I'd go and I'd spend a long time trying to look for something. But it was the whole part that was the gallery was the bookstore. And when it moved, I was really sad because it was there's no bookstores in East LA, none at all. And um, can you believe that? <laughs> and um, and so I, I, I don't think I paid attention. I can't remember what other businesses used to be there. Uh, at that time, when I was a little girl, you know, I knew the businesses there. And then one day I saw this, the door was open uh, next to the gallery, and there was a sign that said, sign up for um, uh, art, uh, art instructors, sign up. And so I looked in there and I said, art instructors, what is this place then, you know, and that. They didn't, I don't remember seeing a sign, I don't think they ever had a sign until much later. And uh, they told me to go and talk to Sister Karen. Well, when I went uh, upstairs to see, uh, meet Sister Karen, she asked me if I, if I knew anything about the Day of the Dead. I said, yes, I do. I know. It's a tradition my mother followed, and uh, we pra you know, she practiced it here in the United States and carried over some of the things that she would do, like altars and different things, flower making. And so I was, I said, well, then come on, come on in and come on Saturdays. It was wonderful. There were so many people upstairs. It was very bare compared to how it turned out later. I mean, the, the, the room was bare of things. There were no partitions. It was just tables and people, mostly we worked on the floor. Uh, and, I, um, and she just said, well, we're going to do headdresses. You could ask Michael Amesqua. But he has this design, it's a cardboard design, but you could do whatever you want with it and then engage the community. But what I do want, um, we had a meeting before it started, I do want museum, I want you all to do at least one museum quality piece because uh, UCLA is looking into uh, keeping a collection of the work we're doing here. And uh, so I, it was wonderful because it was the, uh, I hadn't done large pieces in paper mache. And I learned just by looking at how they were doing things. But uh, while I would help the students, I, we devised our own design. Just, you know, uh, we had lots of um, paper materials and staple, and lots of cardboard, most of it recycled. And I think that they didn't have big budget then. <laughs> um, and so I, I think I designed one, one, uh, one very simple headdress. We were doing head, our, my workshop along with a couple of other people, headdresses for the processions. And so I, I made uh, really simple flat ones that were t to be tied around the neck. And in the meantime, I started designing the one I was going to turn in at, you know, work on whenever I could. And it was uh, using Michael's design, and it turned out to be this tall. And I cut out designs on it. I had so much fun. That was the first year. And and so we did whatever there was it w was needed. And then f for the Day of the Dead, it was a meeting at at Evergreen Cemetery and walking in a procession to Sapa Graphics. And while we were preparing for that the days before and on the, well, it was during that day too, a huge community altar. And it was on the stage. And this one was not coordinated by anyone. Everyone just worked on it. Uh, I worked on some panels for the, for the curtains. And then just, oh, we all painted a, Box and I've tried to use that idea again at Self Graphics. It hasn't been; it just gets doesn't get done. But I would like to do it sometime. We we just uh, we had all these car boxes that were flattened out. I think they were donated, so we just you know 
uh, build them up and painted them black and put our own designs in white. So everybody had their own design. And then we stacked them to make the altar. And then everybody, uh, the, all, all the artists brought things. And I ended up just doing the altar, you know, using everybody's things. So that became my... Uh, it just, I just fell into it because, you know, I had done small altars, never by, on that scale. At home, my mother had four altars during the year. The Day of the Dead was not a huge thing. It was more the ceremony and the celebration than the altar, but uh, she did have, you know, flowers, mostly fresh flowers, and, uh, and the photographs that many families had in their home, you know, who have the family ancestors, the... Uh, uh, and it was just more of the ceremony part. Now, my mother never had skulls. We, we didn't have access to sugar skulls at least, but we didn't make skulls for the altar. It was all uh, paper, uh, flowers, and designs made out of um, cutting out paper, not the fancy papel picado. And I met, she would, uh, what, she re what she did when she was a, a little girl in, in her little town, she had already lived in the United States uh, several years by the time we, she moved to Los Angeles, where I was born. And so this was, uh, it was wonderful because it was like exploring and inventing and just participating in, a, in you know, making things, decorating, which was, I, I just loved it. I had, outside of my home, I hadn't done that on a big scale or publicly. And so that's how it just it just developed, and it was a huge altar, and it, it was all the way to on the stage, and then uh, these boxes that we gathered just built up into the hall, and people would add things to it. But it was just so beautiful, and my my one of my sons uh, and his girlfriend did some face painting, and and Rosana, she was a teenager. Uh, she, this was ninety seven. 79, 1980, 81. Those are the three years that I really got really involved because I had started teaching in 1975. And so what I started doing after those first three or four years that I started with self graphics I, did a, I dedicated a lot of time to doing altars in my school for my class and then, you know, inviting the parents. But uh, I, so I was involved with self graphics Day of the Dead for a few years. And then I had kind of a gap because I, you know, was so teaching, and I, uh, I didn't do the Saturdays. And then in 1988, uh, Irena called me and asked, told me that Sister Karen had asked if I could do an altar for. They were, they had asked somebody, but they were busy. But you know, she knew that I had, I had done the altars for in a gallery. A gallery, oh my God, it was called the Sonrisa Gallery in Little Tokyo. And uh, and I said, well, yes, I, I, I had you know, the idea of doing some place outside of you know, my, my own uh, community or at home it was really something special and just different. And so I did, and I used all the materials they had in their uh, ceramics. In fact, I have a picture of that. It was a Josefina Aguilar couple, wedding couple, they were this big, they were beautiful. So I, I did all, but every, I did everything by hand. It was small and, you know, I did my own papel picado. I brought in our arch from. So I, that, that was the, I guess the first one that I did that was mine. Uh, at self Graphics, it was always the community altar. Um, and so it was a small one and, uh, so that began it, and, and then at self up graphics, I would just started doing my own altar where they would call. Uh, it was part of the gallery. I would I didn't get involved in the community altar. I, I did our own, and that's when my children would start helping me, my son especially. And so from then on, every year I have, I have done one at self up graphics in the gallery, and then in in nineteen ninety seven. No, 96, I believe. Uh, they, oh, it, was, no, it was before Sister Karen died. She died in 1996, seven. Uh, I, had, I had started doing community altars, so I actually was doing two altars, one in the, for the community 
upstairs in the salon and then one that was my own piece or my family's piece that was part of the art exhibit. And so I did, I've done so many altars. I, I don't, I didn't document the early ones uh, or somebody would give me a photograph, but I, uh, from 2000 on, I, I started, uh, I just kept track of everything, even the schematics that I would make. I still have a whole album. And I dug, I've dug up old ones when I come across them and put, add them to my, to the archive that I'm making. But in 19, after 1988, I was, uh, they would call me to do something outside of self graphics when they needed an altar or somebody to talk about Day of the Dead. So they would just call on me if I was available. And uh, then in 19, 1996, Sister Karen, she was really so supportive. I, I, uh, I really admired her and respected her. I never called her Karen. Everyone did, but I just, my, I guess my upbringing, and, and then I, she was close to my age. I had no idea how old she was, but I always called her Sister Karen. And she, she would say, Ophelia or Esperanza, and I, and I said, I wonder why she calls me Esperanza. I guess because of my last name. And she said, I'm sorry, I, I know that's not your first name, but she would, sometimes I thought it was, doesn't she remember me? But it was just, she interchanged my name to Ophelia, Ophelia to Esperanza. And, um, well, doesn't Esperanza mean hope? Yes, it does. And you are a very yeah. source of light. <laughs> and uh, in 1996, she nominated me for an award at the Watts Arts Festival. And so I was awarded. It was called Art Legend. She had received it the year before. So it was just, you know, they opened so, self graphics opened so many doors for me. But I've always been there, you know. I, I never have taken off. I just feel that that's where, I'm, where I belong, where I'm part of. And in fact, uh, I got a call in 1996 from uh, Sister Karen, no, Tomas, and she said, "Would you come in? Sister Karen wants to talk to you." And, uh, and I said, "Oh, I wonder." So what they had he says, "How would you like to go to Scotland?" I said, "Well, Scotland. I've never thought about it." Well, we want you to go to Scotland because they were doing this uh, uh, celebration in Glasgow. Two of the artists um, from there had come under, uh, with a UK, UK uh, artist uh, ex exchange, and several they went. Several artists came to different galleries and museums, and the two that were assigned to Selfographics were here during Day of the Dead, and they what they did were prints. They were printmakers, and they really loved that that. Um, celebration and Sister Karen said that they they decided we want to have one in our in our studio. They had a the Glasgow print studio very much patterned after self help graphic except the artists are paid a nom minimal a nominal fee, but that's how they sustain and then they sold their the, the work there. And uh, Glasgow is a old city and there's a lot of artwork. In fact the the Glasgow School of Art was right next to this studio. And so the plan was that they they patterned our day, of the, our day of the day. They had workshops, people make, you know, artifacts for the, for a procession. And so uh, they asked Margaret Sosa, the, she's the master uh, papel picado person, uh, teacher, artist, and then Yolanda Gonzalez went to represent self graphics. So three of us were, went, and uh, the they sent me asked me what kinds of things I needed. I made a list, and what I took were flowers already. Uh, I made all the flowers at home, and but I didn't open them up so they fit in a little you know bag. And then uh, I took a little uh, set of Mexican dishes that I to represent, you know, me and, and a picture of my mother, my husband, and Our Lady of Guadalupe. So those were the things I took with me because it was their altar. And it was a, it was a wonderful experience. There was a lot of pub nights, though. <laughs> they, lo they loved the pubs right next door. It was so funny because 
we they t well we stayed at a professor from the University of Gla Glasgow. She the art uh, department head. We stayed at her flat. Uh, that was uh, Margaret and I. Uh, Yolanda had some other place to stay. I think she came a little, a couple of days later. But they, she, Margaret and and, uh, and Yolanda stayed longer because I was working and I could only take a week off. In fact, the, my principal was so nice, and I said, I, I'm invited. I have to go. And he said, Of course you go. And how how are you going to name it? He says, Well, can I say that I'm sick? I didn't hear. I didn't hear that. So I took a sick leave. <laughs> it's terrible. <That's> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but I. But it was limited, you know. And uh, then I. I did do some extra work. Uh, well, I did workshops at, at my school. The, I was the art person, uh, just designated because we didn't have art uh, art uh, consultants. We had one for the whole district. So we did our own thing at my school, and I was involved with that. Anyway. Uh, it was such a, the wonderful part about Glasgow was that uh, they they took us to di to uh, dinner and that's where we we'd go eat most of the time, and because it was Latino they had it was Argentine, and they they had it was they had huge pictures of of um, gauchos horses, it was fairly bare. Uh, I don't, not anything really Mexican, but that was the Latino place for us, and they were really cool. They were so nice to us, and but on the day of the dead celebration, oh, the other part was that I had an opportunity to make a print, in as part of the exchange. What they, they had twenty five artists from Glasgow doing prints, and twenty five of ours of that project, and then they exchanged them. Rather, they they made a copy for each one, so. It was a simulta uh, sim simultaneous um, exhibit, 50, uh, 25 artists of Glasgow and self-help at both galleries, in, Glass in Scotland and in here in East L.A. So it was such a great project. It wasn't repeated, but I was so happy to be part of it. So one of my prints was in the gallery, too. And the gallery was an upstairs gallery, very, it, about the size of self-help graphics upstairs, maybe uh, um, and uh, they had a procession from this old, old cemetery that was about two blocks away from the studio. And it's one of those that has the old uh, headstones and crosses. It was, I think it was from the 1300s. And so they had a procession from there. Uh, Margaret and I were getting ready at the flat where we were, and it was rain, it was always raining. And uh, so we, they they ordered a taxi. I can't remember what they call call them, the name they have for them. And Lori? so I think it was Lori. And and there was a lot of traffic once we got closer to the the place. Uh, I, I don't have a good orientation. It was downtown, but it, it uh, but it was everything's old in, in that neighbor. That area was an old area. The buildings are very old too, and. And then it, we were stuck in the traffic, and then Margaret says, I think I know where it is. Shall we get up? And I said, yeah, let's do it, because we were anxious to get there, because the opening supposedly, I can't remember the time, but we were close to that time. In fact, it was we, we were past that time while we, were, we ran, and, and I, you know, I had an idea where we were. So finally, we, were, we hear a band, like a, and they're and lots of yelling, and so we just ran to the front of the studio, and it was packed with people. And the procession had stopped there, and they were playing, and you, and they're playing, da 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 da, -da tequila, <laughs> <laughs> and it was Yolanda leading the tequila each time. Viva Sahara Graphics, and they would say Viva, you say Viva. It was so cute. Well, they played La Bamba and tequila most of the evening in honor of. <laughs> we Chicanas. <laughs> it was so cute, but upstairs it was packed. You couldn't even move. It was ba uh, they had everyone, even though the opening said a, a, you know time, uh, people were there much earlier, and there was uh, artists dressed as Frida Kahlo. Uh, they, uh, have, I have a great shot of this uh, uh, artist with, with a big sombrero, 
and he had a, you know, a Bigliano Zapato painted on. I mean, they were Mexican for that day. And uh, one of the things that, that uh, was beautiful about the altar is that the days before, um, they, we walked to a downtown district that was close by, and uh, the artist who had come, Jane, uh, said, well, you could buy whatever you know. We have a budget. The only thing I bought was I, I needed reeds to make an arch, and they brought me a whole bunch of them, real tiny reeds, so I had a time to, but they were huge. So I, the materials I had, I, it was wonderful because they provided as much as they could. I had already made the flowers, so they had engaged students from that um, arts to come and help me. So I had them open flowers or make flowers. And they were design students, and I had all, we had all this cardboard. So they, I said, well, we need picture frames and we need candle holders. So they made candle holders with cardboard and, and we painted them, and they, they painted uh, frames. It was really a great event. And then they brought, um, I asked them to bring in the staff and to announce to bring in uh, old photographs. And so it was a beautiful looking, it looked, vi it looked vintage already just by the things. And, and on that walk we took downtown, I bought some tar a tartan material to represent them, of course. And uh, uh, Margaret made the papel picado, and we have a beautiful shot. I, uh, she got up on the ladder and took the shot of all the papel before the, the event started. It's beautiful. And it's on, it was on a, on a blog that Alex Ellerhoff put. I don't know if he still has it. I, I printed out the, it's not so clear, and self-help graphics may still, I think it's on the SEMA archives, mm -hmm. and there's some of the photographs from that. I have a couple of them, but I don't have all the, the event mm -hmm. happenings there. So that was my wonderful trip. I stayed there one, one week, and during that week, besides the making of, of the altar and all these things, we had, uh, uh, they had workshops with, with the university, the art school there, and uh, Yolanda showed slides of self graphics and she presented. We did a ceremony uh, of sage before the opening, and it was just a wonderful experience. So I, I was, um, that was one of the big doors <laughs> that self graphics <laughs> for me. I started doing monoprints there in 1991. At that time it was a transition between uh, uh, Oscar Eduardo was there for a short time during, when I started and then Esta Dolores uh, Guerrero Cruz. She was like the interim until they hired someone and then just shortly after is when Jose came in and mm -hmm. so he, the rest of the year. And uh, a year ago, uh, two years ago, before they closed self graphics, uh, the last time I did a print there, uh, I've been trying to get rescheduled, but they have, they say the book, they have all these special projects. So one of my biggest desires is to make some more prints of self graphics. I have, a, I have over a hundred prints that I've done there. Uh, I don't have them all, but that's, I have, I counted that many as far as I can tell. And I was, uh, we were talking there in his little cave there at, at, at the old self of graphics. And uh, I was telling uh, Jose that, you know, the closest I ever came to calling Sister Karen by her name was 10 years later, her death when I did, I was asked to do the altar for her anniversary, 10th anniversary. And I did a, a it was called, the, the show was called flowers from Karen's garden, because she loved her garden. And she lived here in East LA on Gage Street. And she, the year before she died, uh, they, her house was opened on Saturday for water, for artists to come and paint. And so uh, the, her, her garden, her flowers are the artists, you know, who, who she nurtured and helped to grow. I'm one of them. And so when I did a, was looking through the, uh, their collection in bad shape, the, you know, the, her photographs, I was able to look through her pictures, and it was a wonderful experience for me. And when I wrote about the statement, it's, this is the first time I call her Karen. <laughs> I always called her Sister Karen. 
And um, so it was a great opportunity for me to get to know her not only as a director, workaholic, chain smoking, none like no none you've ever known, but also as a daughter, as a colleague. Her community was very close as a woman who, an artist, and uh, it was a really special experience for me to do that altar. And so what Rosana helped me, we did this patio, this garden altar at the corner of Self Help Graphics. And uh, I actually I put things from my garden, my patio, things like rocks and little statues and uh, flowers and and then her photographs in there. So I, it's one of my very dearest uh, altars. And I've done at least, well, a, a th but four years ago, I made a list of how many altars I've done for Sister Karen. At that time, it was like 26 over the, you know, the last, uh, how long has she been gone? 2000, uh, 15, uh, years. 15 years. I've done so many altars. And the year that she died for her memorial, that was the, la that was the first monumental piece that I had done on my well, it was a community altar. Many artists responded and brought so many fresh flowers. And many artists, uh, Irena Cervantes, I can, she's the one I read. There were many others who, they just took over the making the bouquets because that was a big project. It was tons of flowers. And so I had, I start, I, my son helped me and a couple of other people. It, it was uh, Ricky Beltran and Dennis Lawler helped me make the foundation. And, it was, and we kept adding and adding because it, there were so many ofrendas. Artists brought little uh, uh, paintings or, some, or photographs of them and Sister Karen. It was such an outpouring of love, you know, and respect. It, it was very moving. And I was so honored to be asked to, well, they asked me to do the altar, but actually I directed it. I did a lot of it, uh, the foundation, but there were so many people involved that I, it, it was more of a direction. So it was the first huge, uh, uh, outside of the community altars from earlier years that I had done. And after that, they just had become <laughs> monumental because uh, most of the places that I've invited to are large, places and large sites, uh, site-specific uh, altars, so they've grown, and uh, but I now I, my cadre of my children, especially Rosanna, and earlier years it was my oldest son. Whatever needed to be done, my son Javier has just built the foundation, and and so it, it, a lot of planning goes. It's become a major part of my work, uh, my life actually, and so um, I, I went out to Sister Karen. And back to that, that conversation that I was having with Jose, with Joe at Self Help a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago. I was talking to him about that particular altar, how I had called her, you know, I always called her Sister Karen. And he says, well, you, uh, I said, are you sure this is, I can quote you on that? He said, yeah, you know, Sister Karen told me one day, he said, take care of Ophelia. She belongs from this community, and you take care of make sure she has, you know, that she has just gets in, I guess, to do the workshops. And it just made me cry because I thought, I never, you know, thought that it was wonderful to know that she had thought about me in that way. My son Javier is quite creative, and he finds it more as a, not an obligation, a dedication of helping me with altars. And, and so we do brainstorming, it's, it's, and because I feel it's important for me, uh, my family, to be doing the uh, altars very much in a traditional way. Sometimes we are up to a contemporary um, idea, but there's still elements of the traditional way, is that, that they carry this, this uh, tradition on.